This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. When was the last time you felt inspired? Are you ready to take your passions to make a difference while living a life you truly love? Your host, Katana Abbott, who is a life and legacy wealth coach and certified financial planner, searches the world to bring you experts in the field of personal and professional growth, wealth creation, and mind, body, and spirit. So grab a cup of coffee and take that quantum leap you've been waiting for. Smart Women Talk Radio. The link to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Smart Women Talk. I'm your host, Katana Abbott, and this is where I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors, thought leaders and change agents who are on that leading edge. So we have topics like money, business, health, inspiration, and the metaphysical. So I'm very excited today because I get a chance to finally interview best-selling author and founder and president of Yes to Success Seminar. So you've probably heard about them. (laughs) Um, Her name is Deborah Poneman, and we're going to talk about how to take your power back. So we're going to talk about what's preventing you from living in your power, why women tend to compromise themselves more than men, and steps you can take beginning today to live the life you were meant to live. So let me just tell you a little bit about Deborah. Um, for, for four decades, um, Deborah has been, um, she's, well, she's a best-selling author and founder of Yes to Success. She's been doing this for four dec- decades. And um, she has a phenomenal program that I've actually um, attended and um, it was really life-changing. In fact, um, I just want to share that I've had a couple of people say they've seen a huge change in me and it's always wonderful. So um, her program, teach, she's taught hundreds of thousands around the world how to live lives, um, not only of success and abundance, but true happiness in profound self-love. Deborah's clients have used her formula to become mega successful entrepreneurs, renowned transformational leaders, New York Times bestselling authors, impactful world changers, millionaires, and billionaires. Some of them are even household names. Yet Deborah feels her greatest accomplishment is not just that she's helped so many people live their dreams, but she has helped them know how glorious they truly are and how Um, They can most powerfully contribute to the world, to a world that works for everyone. And I can tell you, um, I I just feel that Deborah is just, um, she's like my spiritual coach. (laughs) So um, anyway, you're in for just a wonderful surprise. And and I want to welcome you, Deborah. Thanks for, for agreeing to be on the show. Thank you so much. You know, I've been looking forward to this. I I think we talked for the first time about doing this maybe six months ago, Mm -hmm. and now the day is finally here, and it's the day after International Women's Day, and it's just so perfect, and thank you for inviting me. And you are one of our Smart Women Empower Women partners, and anyone who comes, um, I just want to mention they can come to joinsmartwomen.com. And that's our short URL we made, and it will take you to our community where you can um, join absolutely free and um, receive our wonderful theme-based newsletters. Um, You'll also be able to access the Smart Women Academy where we have 20 experts right now who have contributed fantastic gifts and you are one of them. (laughs) So um, one of the things, we had great gifts. So you should go to joinsmartwomen.com and make sure that you go to the Smart Women Empower Women resource area and then you can access um, Deborah's gift. So... Deborah, okay, I want you to share your story because it's really remarkable. You must have been a baby when you started this program, but we always love women, to, people to share their story because we do bring men here too. It's been a while, um, but 
I want to, I want to hear your story. Like how in the heck did you end up creating this program? Cause you created yes for success many, many decades ago. And it was before internet and everything. How, how did you fall into that? Because I really think that was your purpose and you found it early. Uh, you know, it's interesting about that. You said I was a baby. I was already I had, was teaching meditation for 10 years before I started Yes to Success. Actually, it, wow. this year is going to be my 50 year anniversary of teaching meditation. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. Meditating regularly for 50 years and have taught thousands of people around the world. But uh, that actually dovetails perfectly into my story because at the end of the decade of the 70s, I realized that woman does not live by mantra alone <laughs> and, and that I probably needed to make some money. And how I started Yes to Success was that I was living in a meditation community in Fairfield, Iowa, and I realized that I had to go do something really to, to make a few bucks because it was a nonprofit and I loved what I was doing. Um, I was actually the director of admissions at the time of Maharishi International University. But again, it was bare, I, I, I needed health insurance. I needed car insurance, maybe even a car to insure. So I thought, okay, where do people make a lot of money? I thought, Los Angeles. So I packed my bags <laughs> and I went, to, hey, that's what it looked like on the TV, although I never watched TV. But anyway, so I go to Los Angeles and I thought, how do people make money? They sell investments. So I got a job with a friend who had an investment firm. It was not my deal at all. I mean, if I believed in failure, I would say I was a failure, but I believe that every seeming failure is just a way to learn what not to do next time. And I know what not to do next time. Don't sell investments because if you're Deborah Bonneman. But anyway, we also, uh, there's that expression, you make plan, plans and God laughs. My plan was to make a whole lot of money selling investments and go back and teach meditation full time. <laughs> but one day somebody invited me to a money seminar and I thought it was going to be on stocks and bonds. But when I walked in and this is in the 1980s, the guy was talking about the law of attraction. This was like 30 some years before, 40 years, I guess, before the, um, maybe 30 years before the secret came out. And he was saying that whatever your dominant thought is, like no matter what your financial situation is, if you are always talking about how poor you are and you're never gonna get out of debt and the economy is so horrible and you know, I'll always be poor and my parents were poor, you are going to draw poor into your life. The guy said that if it's like a tuning fork, if a tuning fork is vibrating at an F sharp, it cannot draw, draw in a B flat. So if you are vibrating poverty, you cannot draw in prosperity. And he told us no matter what your financial situation is, you have to start talking about the great financial times to come and the success that you're going to have to come and, and paint those word pictures and you'll start vibrating that. He said, even go down to Beverly Hills and walk down the street and look at the Rolls and Bentleys and the Mercedes and the big houses and say, and that's for me and <laughs> see yourself in those houses. And I thought, you know what? You know what I did? I actually went and I was so broke. All I'd been doing for my entire adult life was teaching meditation and just barely being able to make ends meet. I went to the Mercedes dealership and I got a picture of the Mercedes that I wanted and I put it up on my bulletin board. Anyway, long story short, um, I came home from that event and it just struck me. Mm -hmm. That's why I came to LA because I was supposed to go to that event. And I'm supposed to be teaching this because I already knew how to teach people how to create inner silence through meditation. Oh but now there is, I found out that there is a systematic way to create outer success. And I thought, wow, now I could teach people the whole package. And um, so I quit my job the next day. I was like, oh, you quit your job. Remember, I hadn't sold one investment. But I quit my job the next day. And I started studying the great masters of success and prosperity, Napoleon Hill and Wallace Waddles and Florence Goldville Shin and, and Earl Nightingale. And I put together a fabulous uh, weekend seminar called it Yes to Success launched it. And I mean, you know, there are a lot of other details, like I used what I was learning to create my success. Like, for example, I learned that you don't wait until you think you're ready because you will never think you're ready. 
because we live in a relative universe, there are always going to be loose ends. You can't say, oh, I'll start my company when the kids are grown or when the kids start school or when the divorce goes through or I get the inheritance or my hair turns green. No, you. if you have an idea, the idea comes to you. I say it's a gift from the creator because the creator looks down and sees you as a worthy vehicle for manifesting that idea on earth at this time. So the creator obviously chose me to teach these principles of inner and outer success. So who was I to deny my assignment on the planet? And also the idea comes to you at the time when the wind is at your back, the time when the creation needs your idea to work. You know, we're all pieces of the puzzle and, and okay. your piece was is needed at the time that the idea comes to you. And if you don't take action on it, I mean, I don't have to do it that minute, but you got to start taking steps in the right direction. Then the idea is going to go to the second stringer because the creator needs it manifested on earth. So I learned all those principles from the great masters. I didn't make them up. I studied. I, I went to the library and I took out the microfiche and I found all of the, do you know what microfiche is? You're too young. Um, no, I'm Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're being very nice. <laughs> well, so you remember microfish, we didn't have the internet. Yeah. We didn't, you know, we had to go and really dig and find this stuff. But anyway, I used all of those principles. What is sacred should be kept secret. I didn't go around telling everybody what I was going to do because all the great master says you got it said you have to keep the steam in the kettle. And if you tell everybody what you're going to do, you're letting the steam out of the kettle. And also you might bump up against the discouragement committee. Those people who are going to tell you all the reasons why your idea won't work, who are going to crush your idea when it's a tiny seed. Why would you tell everybody what you're going to do when your seed can be crushed, when the discouragement committee can tell you all the reasons why your, your idea won't work? So I kept what was sacred, my idea to teach us to success. What was sacred, I kept secret until I was ready to launch. And then I did. I put up some posters. Deborah, my name wasn't old Palman at the time, it was Olson. I've had a few. And anyways, Deborah yes. Olson to teach <laughs> how to say yes to success. And um, and the rest is history. The, it, within the next few years, my seminars were being taught all over the world by reps. And I was teaching in 12 major cities in the US. And within three years, I was driving a Mercedes, even though when I started, I was driving a 10 year old beat up Chevy Bel Air that my aunt had left me when she passed away. God bless her aunt Flo. But um, and not only was I driving the Mercedes, I was driving the exact Mercedes that I had put the picture up. The mind is a powerful thing to create mm -hmm. reality. And I didn't go out and buy that Mercedes. The, the quick story is that I also got married. And um, and somebody was doing one of those drive away car things and stopped in the town that I was living in and called my husband and said, asked if he wanted to buy it. And he called me, said, honey, do you want a Mercedes? And I said, well, what color is it? Because <laughs> I wanted the navy blue one that was in my picture. He says, well, it's navy blue. I said, oh, OK, I'll take it. It's and like the universe personally, just like um, at Wall uh, Wallace Waddles. He yes. talked about how if you want a sewing machine back in 1900, <laughs> uh, someone starts building it over here and this starts happening. And, you know, and I've seen those kind of miracles happen um, real quickly and then more long term. And um, the, I think, you know, I don't have a vision board right now. Um, I'm in I'm in the um, year your year of miracles. And I've got my sticky notes up here, you know, from, from that. And, uh, but I don't have a vision board. And I think I'm going to put it back up because when I did my last one, it was amazing. Just like you said, um, how the things all fell into place, even a property that we bought down in Panama. And I just did a picture of a, um, a point of all this jungle sticking out in the ocean. And then when we flew down to go visit this place that we were going to look at, that was the picture practically. And we ended up buying and I didn't really even know this was going to happen. So I don't, so it really, there's magic to it, but there's also practical things. I always like to combine the spiritual with the practical. Yeah. And, you know, that's like Johnny Asaroff's story that he, he had made a, um, a vision board and then he just put it away in his garage. And, you know, decades later, about, I think he said 15 years later, he moved and he was going through some stuff and he pulled out his vision board and he looked, 
he didn't remember putting a picture of a house on the beach and I think it was Malibu and he looked and he was living in that house. <laughs> it cut it out from a magazine like 15 years before. So, you know, vision boards it may seem like just a fun little parlor game, you know, that, oh, let's get together and create a vision board. Very powerful. Yeah. And so the, that must have stayed in his brain because, you know, they say what you focus on expands and, you know, you don't want to focus on what you don't want because I know, so I know I do this. I end up ruminating on something and then I'm like, and I, this morning I did cancel, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, and you, I, I changed it. Pardon? You mentioned your year of miracles and, and our wonderful Marcy Shimoff when you know this story about how Marcy, who Marcy and I are the founders of your year of miracles, although I'm not teaching with her anymore because I, I went back to my first love, which is teaching yes to success. But when Marcy first took yes to success in the early 1980s and you know she actually became my secretary assistant and a good secretary she was <laughs> but her favorite thing out of you know two and a half days of teaching yes to success principles was cancel <laughs> like you, you <laughs> say a negative thing. and then also her other favorite thing is when you see something that somebody else has that you want instead of begrudging them like oh why do they have that you know they're such a jerk and blah, 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 you just say that's for me. So that's what I did when I saw people in Mercedes. See, I grew up to think I was taught that rich people were bad. That's what I was taught when I was growing up very subtly, but I was taught that rich people were bad and they were crooks. And so, and so I found myself looking at people who were driving Mercedes and thinking, oh, well, that's a bad person or that's a crook. And I went, cancel. Yes. That's for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I have to go back and I had a conversation with my husband and I, I have to go back and change what I said to him, you know? So is it okay to go back later? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm going to, and uh, I won't go into the story cause it's too personal <laughs> about somebody. So, um, but you know, we really have to keep these things top of mind. Yeah. And when we learn these kind of skills, we become so much more confident and um, today we're here to talk about this idea of shining and standing in, in our true power. And I'm so thrilled you came to talk about that. So what is, what is your definition of someone who's standing in their, their true power, their personal power? Okay, well, it's, it's not a short answer. Well, you'll notice none of my answers right. are short <laughs> answer. <laughs> You know, as I said, most of my adult life, I've spent teaching seminars on how to create true and lasting success. And the majority of the people who I've worked with from all over the world for the last 40 years have had some success in their life. In fact, they've had some real successes and some people are super achievers and are very successful in the eyes of the world. But as powerful as people appear on the outside, Katana, and you know this, for many it's not how they feel on the inside. No. On the inside, there is still an emptiness, maybe even like a real gnawing emptiness. And many people believe that when they, you know, when they made their money or they had the recognition or they bought the beautiful home or they became a princess, right? right. That somehow life would be perfect and that emptiness would somehow vanish. And yet when they walked into that new home or down the aisle of West, Westminster Abbey, it was like walking into one of those houses on a Hollywood movie set. The emptiness was still there on the other side, the new house or the Tesla, or even you know, the best-selling book or the Nobel Prize does not take the emptiness away. The gift of this time on our planet is that we're seeing the fragility of life and we're asking ourselves, what is really important? And we're wanting to live a different kind of success and, and a new kind of power. And to me, that's the kind of power that comes from being aligned with your own truth. Hmm. It's the kind that comes from having your inner match your outer. Hmm. It's the kind that comes from knowing what your real purpose is for being here and following the voice that urges you to do it. It's the kind of power that comes from having integrity, from not saying one thing 
and being another. Mm -hmm. That's true power. Because I'll tell you something else, and you know this, lots of times we think success is based on what other people think about us, but it's really based on what we think about ourselves. And even if we fool everybody into thinking, you know, life is good and I'm this and I'm all that, if you know you're not all that, that is what zaps your power, takes your happiness away. But it, it takes affects you. our health, doesn't it, Deborah? Absolutely fix everything about your yeah. life. And our joy. Yeah, that's really, it's, it's too bad. I, you talked about how people see us differently than we see ourselves. When I was a financial advisor at American Express Financial Advisors, that's a mouthful, I was there 20 years. And I remember at one point I um, was able to get a $10,000 sponsorship from American Express for the um, Women's Economic Club. So they kind of made me a, you know, big cheese and put me up on the dais and, you know, for panel discussions and always up at the front sitting. And um, I remember they invited me to, before one of the events, to this little, like, cocktail um, hour to meet with the other bigwigs, I guess they call them. <laughs> and I remember walking around there and the way they were treating me, they, they were they were thinking I was in a, you know, like an executive vice president from American Express. And, and I was still new in, in my um, business. And I remember walking out of that room and just thinking, wow, that's how people see me. And it was such a shift. So does, you know, but I didn't see myself like that yet. I still, you know, saw myself as, you know, who I'd always been. And so then, you know, my goal was to step into that and, and, and just show up at that level. And then that's when you begin to step outside the box and stretch a bit, right? Yeah, I'm going to actually talk about that a little bit later on when I start giving people some tips. <laughs> okay, so um, with so many of us that are afraid to stand in our personal power, um, what do you think it is? Do you think it's just limiting beliefs or, or what is going on that we're afraid, you know, we're afraid to shine. And I know I, that happens to me all the time. I have, I do have self-doubt and I know all of us do, because I know some of the most famous movie stars, even, you know, they've talked about it. So how, even, where does, what happens here? Why does this happen? <laughs> well, there are so many reasons, but, you know, we now live at a time where the only way to create true success and deep fulfillment and genuine happiness and real power, as I said before, it's to go inside and it's to tap the greatest power we have as humans. And that's the power of self-knowledge and self-love and a deep sense of our own value, no matter how much we gain or lose on the outside. But unfortunately, we've been conditioned to look outside ourselves for validation. Mm -hmm right? So yeah. we are incessantly comparing ourselves to others. And that's one of the things that takes our um, power away, especially now with social media. But what people don't understand, it's well, Mark Twain once said that comparison is the death of joy. And research has shown that comparing ourselves to people we think are better than us fosters not only a lack of self love, but can even lead to like depression. And the truth is that when you're comparing yourself to someone, it's like those airbrush models on the cover of the magazines. Oh, yeah. What you're seeing is, it's kind of like on social media. People only share the part of their lives that they want to that they want to reveal. It's not the truth. Mm -hmm. It is like the airbrush covers on the the covers of the mag, the airbrush models on the covers of the magazine. That isn't what they really look like. Mm -hmm. But we lose our power when we think that we'll never be that beautiful. We'll never be that happy. That's why we're always shocked when we hear about the suicide of the beaming celebrity who seemed to have it all or the beaming mom down the street with the perfect kids. Um, Best-selling mom. Just the children themselves this is happening to. It's, it's just so devastating. Because we believe what we see on social media. We believe that those people's lives are perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, best-selling author Steve Furtick, I, I don't know if you know him, but I love his writing. He said, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's 
highlight reel. <laughs> and it's funny because as a speaker, we make our highlight reel. We have had those times where we have fallen on our faces when we've given a talk. We have times, I, a friend of mine had a time like in the middle of one of her talk to thousand people, she had to run out of the room because she had diarrhea, you know, oh. I mean, but we don't put that up. We put our highlight reel and we got the standing ovation. And then people think, oh, I can't become a speaker because look at them. That's like, you know, one minute of thousands of hours. So right. we also, and we also compare ourselves. This is really sad to people we see as less than ourselves because it gives us a boost. You know, we take pleasure in someone else's lack or weakness or misfortune, or my kids got more awards than your kids, or my kid went to Harvard and your, yours went to junior college. But there is always going to be a backlash when you have that kind of thinking, because the wheel of karma turns and, um, and then we end up feeling a greater emptiness than ever before. So here's what I teach. Okay. If you have to compare yourself, compare yourself to yourself hmm. and that's the only way you're going to have true power so how so, do we do that <laughs> i'll tell you how how have i improved myself since last year okay what new risks have i been willing to take these days what negative behavior have i let go of how have i increased the the acts of kindness how have i been more vulnerable and less from the ego you see so what we do, you know, a lot of people, um, they put like, like we do miracles journal and your year of miracles or people do their success journal. I say, make a journal of all the ways that you've improved yourself. How, like you said, you said earlier that from taking my course, yes, to success, that people have even commented on you write down those ways that you've changed. That's what really boosts your ego, not you know, reveling in someone else's misfortune, because then the wheel of karma is going to come back and smack you. Mm -hmm. But when you compare, when we compare ourselves with someone else, it's not only a waste of time, but you know what? You weren't born to be them. You were born to be you. I love the, the, the story of the great 18th century um, Kabbalist, Rabbi Zusha. I, I'm always quoting from Kabbalah, as you know. And he said, um, when I go to heaven, God will not ask me, why were you not more like Moses? Why you, were you not more like Abraham? God will only ask me, why were you not more like Zusha? All we have to do is be authentically ourselves. And you are going to start to have so much self-love you know, um, I was just on a... Um... And it's scary, though. You know, address that. It's very scary to be yourself. You know, and I, I'm writing a... Well, I'm writing something right now. I'm writing, I'm working on a book. And um, I have a story in the introduction. But the story I really want to tell, I'm afraid to tell. So how well, often does that happen? <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. Because this just happened um, right before I got on this interview. Okay. I was on a call with a friend of mine who just wrote a book and this is her book called School Disrupted. And it's about rediscovering the joy of learning during pandemic. It's a, it's an amazing book that will help people who are homeschooling their kids because they have to out of the first, for the first time. And I made, and there was a, um, there are a bunch of people on this call and I was speaking on it. And I said this sentence, I said, yeah. And you know, those people who are on these panels and they're not even moms and they're giving us moms or dads and they're giving us parenting advice. And then I went on and afterwards I thought, I can't believe I said that because there are brilliant people who can give us parenting advice. You don't have to be a parent to get parenting advice, but you know, but the reason why I said that is because the other day I was on a panel where well, someone was on a panel, I said something to them and they said, well, I know what it's like to be a parent. I mean, don't think I don't because I have Bijou and Bijou is the name of her dog. Right, right. <laughs> and, and like, that was the reason why she felt that she knew what it was like to be a parent because she had a dog. Now, 
I have my ranger, okay? I know what it's like to be a, a, a dog parent and a parent parent. I can't put my kids in a kennel if I want to. You know? Just like I did, shut them outside my office. <laughs> and you can't like shut them, put them in their little cage. And you know, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot different, right? However, that, and, and I'm still raw from that kind of like, um, I don't think so. But, and here's why I want to tell you this story, because I made that statement and I was on a panel today and I was an expert and people were looking at me as an expert. And when I thought about it a little bit further down into the talk, I said, you know, I just want to say something. I want to apologize. I want to apologize that I said, you know, and these people who aren't even parents are in panels about parenting. And I know that there are brilliant experts who aren't parents on parenting. And I mean, not only do they have nieces and nephews and godchildren or their, their teachers, but you don't have to have cancer to be a cancer specialist, mm -hmm. right? You can learn, you can study, you can observe. And, and I'm a child. <laughs> Pardon? And you were a child. You were a child, right? <laughs> but the point of this is that I had to be very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And after I, I mean, it was hard to say, you know, I'm really sorry. I said something really stupid and I was the expert. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm sharing with that with, that with you is if I had um, gone back and, and, you know, or not said anything about it because I didn't want to look like I was wrong, that would have been coming from the ego. And what I'm saying is right now in 2021, people can sense inauthenticity a mile away. When somebody is speaking, you know, leading a course or a, or a seminar or a Zoom or on the stage, whatever, and they're saying one thing and you could just feel in your bones that they aren't living what they, we couldn't feel in our bones years ago, but I think the veil is thinner now. Oh, Right? Am I right? I, can I share something? You know, that I've Please. been watching all these, you know, webinars recently. And, and I watched one with one of these real big um, marketing coaches, right? And so I, she did the, the webinar, the PowerPoint, she was live and there was 500 people or maybe 800 people that were on it. And um, she just sounded so disconnected. But she was saying how when you learn these secrets, you are going to be so successful and you're going to have your, and I won't call the name of the, but these best clients and high income and all this stuff. And I just felt like it was so hollow. And then when she finally came on at the end, I just felt so sad for her because she seemed so exhausted and drained. Like she's working so hard and this isn't what she thought she was going to end up doing. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. You know, it was like, you're right, all this stuff. And I was and I oh, and then I saw in the right column, someone saying, I just don't know if I can afford to go into debt to get another program, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking, Oh, my gosh, this is so sad. This is going on in the world, all these people wanting, wanting, wanting. Um, and, you know, there are really great people out there. But then, you know, there are just, I, I think people that have programs that are I don't know, you know, maybe part of the people will get something out of it, but it's very sad. But there was, you could just feel this, um, this person was just not happy and drained, but pretending. But I think that what could have worked for that person if she was unhappy and drained is we ha is being vulnerable and honest. Those are the most powerful things we could do right now is to be vulnerable and honest. And she could have said, you know, you may notice that I look a little tired and um, I have things going on in my life, but I want you to know that even when you use my formula, I promise that you will get more clients. I promise that you will make more money because it is work for me, even when I'm this tired. Oh, and Deborah, that's so important because I just judged. I right? judged. And it's COVID and who knows what's going on. So see. Right, who knows what's going on. But the point is, is that like you said, oh, you're writing a book and you don't want to include the thing that the, the books that are going to be the most successful are the ones that are the most vulnerable. The people who are going to be the most esteemed, I mean, truly esteemed are the people who 
uh, as my friend Janet Atwood said, are the teachers living their teaching? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whew. Wow, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> oh, so that's beautiful. And, you know, one of the things that, um, that I've noticed, too, that women really seem to handle power differently than men. <laughs> and why is that there I mean there is such a difference in how women and men stand in their power and it has to be how we were raised and maybe part of it is just who we are as women well you hit the nail on the head the reason why we are we acquiesce we're contrite we're apologetic is because we watched our moms in the female role models I mean I was a child of the 50s and 60s. My mom was the, the quintessential housewife. And even though she was, she was valedictorian of high school class, even though her mom died when she was nine and she had to raise her little brother and, and, but she, and she went to work after school and worked until midnight and blah, 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 blah. And still she was a housewife and there's nothing wrong with being a housewife let me tell you because you know my story I actually gave up my career to be home with my kids for 21 years but I am glad you asked that question because I would love to share um, with our listeners some things that they can do to own more of their power in this still male dominated glass ceiling uh, society in which we live can I share some things? Absolutely. That'd be great. I think it's time to take some notes too. <laughs> okay. Well, there's an article in Forbes about 10 years ago and, and that I love to quote from. They listed ways that we can stop being so accommodating mm -hmm. and start growing in our power. And they said that there were things that we could do on the outside. And if we did these things on the outside, it would actually affect inner changes. They also said if we did these things, it would make a big difference in the way we per were perceived mm -hmm. so by ourselves and also by other people and one was okay drum roll please get rid of the word just mm -hmm. i'm going to give you an example oh i'm just checking in to see no i'm checking in to see wow in and i'll give you some more words i just want you to know i want you to know mm -hmm. And there, there is a survey or some research that was done that women say just as a qualifier, like, you know, 500 times more. I don't remember the number, so I won't pretend that I do more than men. <laughs> men say, men say, I want you to know. Women mm -hmm. say, I, I just want you to know. Men say, I called because. Women say, I just called because. Mm -hmm. Okay. Impact of eliminating that one word. So let's make it. I don't even know if there's a chat. Let's make the commit the commitment. We get rid of the word just. And um, I did it, and it was scary because it is it's it's crazy. I'm just taking out that. Okay. So how, how about with email versus speaking? How does it show up? You know, right? But, no, it, 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 just in all the time. Just just be polite. Yeah, polite. Really. Yeah, polite and apologizing. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's more. There is also an article in the Harvard Business Review ab about replacing weak, meaningless words like with stronger ones. I think the author's name is a while ago. I read a Jerry something Weissman, Wiseman, something like that. And he talked about how a simple word replacement can change the power of a communication. He said, instead of saying, I think. And I believe we should opt for stronger options. Like I'm confident that mm. instead of, well, I believe that this would really work. I'm confident that this will really work. Well, belief is a strong word, but apparently. Well, not as strong as belief. I know this will work. And what was the yeah. other said? Well, no is a little bit different okay. because you don't really know, but okay. I'm confident that this, or I'll give um, you an example okay. instead of, um, I feel like that would happen. We might want to say, I expect that that could happen. Mm. I feel like that could happen is a weaker word than I expect that that could happen. So just little replacements can make a difference in how our message is perceived. Now, like you say, we don't want to be bullies. Okay, we don't want to be right at all costs. We don't want to be like the boss and the devil wears Prada, but we also want to stop wimping around. 
And another thing we tend to do as women is we tend to consistently apologize, mm-hmm. even when it's not necessary. Have you noticed that men don't do that? Right. right. I mean, if they, and if they do, they're perceived as weak. I mean, saying you're sorry um, just unnecessarily puts you in a subservient position. So watch when you apologize. And I'd say eliminate the phrase, I'm, I mean, you know, like I apologize during this talk I gave today, but, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Were you busy? I'm so sorry. You know, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Was that out of place? I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Just stop it. Yeah. You can even say, oh, did I speak out of place? Mm. Yeah. But not, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Did I speak out of place? It's, it's a, and, and it, it sounds sexist, but it is a female thing. We were grown, we were raised to be that way and many of us in the workplace have experienced one more thing and that is letting people take credit for your ideas I okay have, that happen an example. To me. Yeah. have you I done have that, that? To me and I quit my job because it was a huge thing I did and my boss they wrote it up in the newsletter that I mean it was this there was this big file cabinet with all these flyers that came back with surveys and so I said, what are they sitting there for? I don't know. I'm in the art department, right? And I said, why don't we, publications in art. And I said, why don't we um, add them up and see what we get? And so I, add, I started, I did a graph and I came up and, and they, they showed it to our executive vice president, right? And he said, oh, we have a new forecasting tool. <laughs> and, you know, the, my, my, um, the art director, he graphed it with the tape in the old days. They had that sticky tape that they would use and press on letters and everything. And I'm sitting there and, and it was an engineering company. So I ended up leaving. But I thought, I cannot believe that this man did not even, you know, say, how did this happen? Right. And I never, I never really said a word about it, but I ended up leaving and um, going into sales, you know, door to door, calling on businesses, something very, bra- very brave, but yes, um, very brave when I was only in early twenties, you know, so, but to see that happen and I, I guess that could happen anywhere, but. Oh, it happens all the time. And, and I actually have a solution. I have something that people could try on, see if it works. Okay, good. Okay. Let's have it. <laughs> so you bring up a point in a meeting and you're ignored. Nobody notices. Later, someone else, more often than not, a man, sorry, will repeat your thought and people will applaud his great idea. <laughs> See, when you stay silent and you let others take credit for your ideas, bam, you just give your power away. So I say, take back the credit. And here's how you do it. You say, thank you, God. Thank you, John, for bringing up that idea that I proposed earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and he can't lie and say, no, you didn't, because he knows for a fact that he heard it from you. But again, it's powerful. Thank you, John, for bringing up that idea that I proposed earlier. Perhaps people didn't hear when I said it. You could even say that, or you don't even need to. So just a few little things that we can start out with. Our language, not apologizing. Don't let anybody take, don't let other people take credit for your ideas. And um, anyway. And, and let's just expand on that too for, for people listening. How important is it to watch our words, you know, and our thoughts? And because when we're thinking and when we're speaking, I mean, we're actually manifesting things out there. We don't realize that, you know, whether it's good or bad. I mean, the good things, that's great. But, um, you know, I, I said something to my husband because, you know, I, I haven't been able to walk. I've been in, I had foot surgery. Oh. And so for, this is going into the second month that, you know, my husband's been waiting on me. And I said, you know, Mark, you've never had a broken bone or anything. And I mean, I really have had like a bunch of surgeries <laughs> in the last couple of years. And I, and I said, you know, I, and I said, I, I, I wish you could just experience this and see what it's like. And then I said, can't, that's the thing. I said, can't. <laughs> Cause I thought the last thing I want is for something to happen to him because that's not what I meant, but that's what I said. I didn't yeah. want, I didn't want him to really have it happen, but how important is it to watch what we say? Well, you know, have you ever, if I ever shared with you, have you ever heard my near death experience where I actually saw the power of the words, like, um, 
from the other side. Yeah. You ever, have you heard that? Yeah, I would love you to share that. So, cause I, I think that's so powerful. Yeah, well, the um, story, I'll spare you all of the gory details, but I became sick. I remember it was a Monday and I, and, and I wasn't really sick. I just had a little bit of a scratchy throat. I thought felt a little fluey, but usually yeah, I take my zinc, I take my C, I take my echinacea, you know, load myself up, up with electrolytes and um, not Gatorade, but I <laughs> sugar-free electrolytes. And because bacteria feeds on sugar, so you don't want to <laughs> do sugar-filled electrolytes. That was a word from our sponsor. But um, <laughs> but usually I just take those, those things and I feel fine. I never, ever really get sick. Nothing like really takes hold. But that, that week, it was crazy because no matter what I did and how much of uh, echinacea and vitamin C I took, it wasn't doing the trick. And by the end of the week, it was Saturday and I was lying in bed and I had the thought, I am sicker than I have ever been in my life. And I think I could die here. I was living alone at the time because my husband and I were separated. And so I did what any intelligent person would do. I'm not recommending this. I called my favorite healer <laughs> and I said, um, you know, I could barely speak. I said, I am really sick. And he, and I said, you need to help me. He said, okay, I'll help you, but you have to promise you'll do exactly what I tell you to do. And I said, anything. He said, call 911 immediately. Wow. So I couldn't even dial the phone at that time or press the button, mm. open my eyes. So he called 911 and um, the, um, what do you call it? The ambulance arrived. They had to break down the door because I couldn't even get out of bed or break in the door. And um, they said to me, uh, what hospital do you want to go to? And I whispered, Evanston. And they decided that they couldn't afford the 11 minutes to get me to Evanston Hospital because they didn't think I would make it. So they took me to this little cute little hospital around the corner and I'm in the ER and I'm on the gurney and they are hooking me up to every tube and every monitor imaginable. And my blood pressure was like 52 over 28. I mean, it was, I, and also it turned out that I had what's called a sepsis. Yeah. And it's when these deadly bacteria get into your blood, I just come back from a developing country. And, um, and about 50% of the people who have an advanced sepsis don't make it. And I had two bacteria in my blood. Oh. And um, so anyway, I'm lying there and they're all rushing around trying to save my life. And I start going to the other side and I find myself hovering in, in between this place, in this place between life and death. And I notice that when my eyes were open, I could see everybody running around the room trying to save my life. When my eyes were closed, I could see everybody running around the room trying to save my life. But I also saw something additional. And that was that there is this beautiful radiant light that was guiding every single thing that was going on in the room. And, you know, just the, the, the way that the, the nurses move their hands and the way, and I remember one of the nurses trying to, um, what do you call, hang up an IV bag and she, she drops it and everybody shoots through these daggers. But I saw something else. And that is, you know how people say, oh, there are no mistakes in the universe. I saw that there are no mistakes in the universe, that this light was orchestrating everything in perfection. Mm -hmm. And I saw that when she bent down to pick up the IV back off the gurney, another nurse was able to see a monitor and she ran to the other side of the room. She moved something on the monitor that probably saved my life. So I'm lying there and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it is true. There are no mistakes in the universe. And then I'm still hovering in this very interesting place between life and death. And my, my former husband who I was separated from, but still my dear, dear friend had come in and it didn't look like I was going to make it. And I saw him with like tears rolling down his face and I saw a nurse go over to him and put her hand on his shoulder and say to him, don't worry, she's going to be fine. And there is no reason at that point for her to say that. But I saw Katana that when those words, she's going to be fine, came out of her mouth, they went into my body and they strengthened every cell in my body. They made her words made me fine. And I'm lying there. I'm thinking I have been teaching the power of your words for the last, what, 35 years it was at that point. And now I have this proof. I'm seeing it with my own inner eye. She said she's going to be fine. And it give, gave me all my strength back. And then a few minutes later, the doctor came in, looked at the monitors. And in this really gruff voice, voice said, 
get her blood pressure up or we are going to lose her. And when he said, we're going to lose her, I saw this gunk come out of his mouth, accompanying his words. It was, it was like brown and gray and it even smelled, it smelled like a swamp and it went out of his mouth and it went into my body and it took all of my strength away. And I remember lying there and I said, I made a deal with God. I said, God, let me live because I want to tell people how truly powerful their words are. You know, Catherine Ponder says, your word is your wand. Your word is your wand. People say your words have power over life and death. Your words have power over life and death. The Bible says, thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be added unto you. It doesn't say thou shalt decree a thing and eh, give it a chance. It might be added unto you. No, the Bible says you say something, it will be added on to you. And I also promised at that moment, I said, and I promise I will never again say anything that I don't want to happen. And including things like, oh, my daughter is so this and my son is so this. And, you know, I don't say this, but, you know, he'd forget his head if it wasn't screwed on. You know, those things that we say about our kids. I promise I would never do that again because I realized every time I said something about my children, I was just making it happen. I was just strengthening that thing that I wanted to unstrengthen. And um, well, the good news is I lived. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and, um, and the other good news is that now I can teach people with so much authority that what you decree absolutely it's just like in the movie what the bleep if you've ever seen the movie what the bleep they oh, yeah. prove scientifically yeah. not only just the power of your words but the power of your thoughts that your thoughts can actually move matter mm -hmm. so do you want them it, your thoughts moving matter in the direction of more power more success more happiness more joy more love or do you want to keep saying those things that you don't want in your life it's up to you that is so powerful. And, and that's why, you know, I think, you know, I mentioned my family mentioned to, you know, my husband and, and then um, my assistant, actually, I've seen such a huge difference. And it's just, I've, I've been doing personal development again. I think I went into a funk with COVID and I just stopped and having someone there, you know, to help support you and, and, and um, teach you new things. And, you know, hearing the story, it really made me think about my words and I've been much more careful about words yes. and thoughts. So and that's, we, and that's why community is, is important too. Yeah. And that's why when I teach Yes to Success, we, we have our Facebook community, we have our mastermind groups because supporting each other, because it's yes. easy to slip away and start saying negative things when you're off on your own. So the community is so important to support one another. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So we are... Um, do you know we're at the top of the hour? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so anyway, you know, we were we were going to share the three um, the three keys to personal power, and um, and I also want to make sure you share with everyone about yes to success. Can you? How would you like to wrap? We have you know two minutes here, so <laughs> okay, we only have two minutes. Well, I think that I have shared a lot more than three keys to personal power. <laughs> I was going to talk also about need, the, the need of women to be liked. Just, okay, bottom line to that, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere. You know, that women thing, that likability thing. Um, I, 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 again, I think that I think that once we begin to live with a profound connection to our power within, then um, what I love about it, then we're not afraid to share power with others. We mm -hmm. don't feel threatened by other people's success. In fact, we rejoice in it. And one of the ways to develop that power within is to start rejoicing in other people's success, mm -hmm. even if you don't feel it yet. Yeah. Like I'm a speaker. If I see somebody get a gig that I would have liked instead of rah, 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 so happy and find something good about the, the, the speech that they give and, and, and tell other people how great their speaking is truthfully, because what you're going to find is that when you, um, when you're able to do that for others, then that's when people are going to respect you and you are, will effortlessly have 
influence and support and not only from others from but but from all the energies of the universe mm. and that's the new kind of power oh that's just so beautiful well i want everyone to know about your program because it is so life-changing and it's joyful and um you are so authentic and you have like uh, like hundreds and hundreds thousands of people you know that are following you um and being in these courses so can you can you just tell us how people can join with you i know you have an ebook and you can we can send them to the website because yes why don't people just go to yes to success y-e-s-t-o not the number two yes to success.com forward slash ebook and then you'll get this ebook which is the five keys to living a life of true success where i share five more keys. And then if you get the ebook, then I'll send you the information about my upcoming yes to success course. It's so, it's so coincidental because I'm starting one April 1st yeah. and I only do it once a year yeah. and, um, and it just happens to be coming up. So, yeah, so exciting. Good, like, good. We'll, we'll share all this on the social media too. So thank well, you. so wonderful. <laughs> And um, I am so thrilled that you came here and shared your message because this is so inspirational, especially during these difficult times for everyone who's listening live. So thank you so much for being and here. Thank you for Smart Woman Talk Radio and all of the Smart Woman, all of the material and all of the other courses. It is such a gift and you're a gift. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone. And we've got Rhonda Britton coming in a couple of weeks, Fearless Living. We're so excited. And she'll be talking about power. And for those who um, want to come join us, it's joinsmartwomen.com. And until our next show, go out and live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Thank you for joining us here at Smart Women Talk Radio, a place to learn, prosper, and grow. Tune in again next week for another exciting episode of Smart Women on the CTR Network. And remember to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity.